So this um, this morning, as always, we are learning to walk in the truth with Jesus Christ. Uh, the truth is not just reading the word. The truth is understanding the word. So it's the most the most important thing is not that we read the word. It's not based on quantity is based on quality. Do you understand what you just read? When I learned that, I realized that sometimes, you know, because I read through the Bible real fast, but I didn't understand it all. And so when I learned to read through and understand stuff, and I learned that it's a, it's a marathon, it's not a quick race, what I found is that sometimes I would get lost on just one sentence. I would read one sentence and be into that sentence, searching the, 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 the gospel, looking at the, the history of it, looking at, looking at what's happening, I would get more out of doing that than seeking through the whole gospel, reading it real fast, and not getting anything but uh, bits and pieces here and there. So we're learning to walk in the truth. And this is a truth not based on emotions. And so uh, we know, we understand that. It's not based on your emotions. And so if you take your emotions out of it and just trust God and what he has for us, your understanding is based on faith that is in Jesus Christ. Because if you base it on emotion, then there's something in your life that you say, if this happens, I'll do, I'll be with God. But if this happens, I'll leave. So you say, uh, God can give me this and give me that, but if he takes this person away from me, I'll stop going to church. Everybody has that IQ level, what we call I quit level. So you gotta take your emotions out and just trust God and it becomes easier. So the name of the service today is entitled, What Makes Me Beautiful? Or What Makes You Beautiful? Uh, because it's, it's important to understand this, we're taking steps towards getting closer to God. It's freak, there are frequently asked questions on, uh, is it okay to have uh, certain types of things on our body, like body piercing? Is it okay to have certain things like tattoos? Is it okay to have those things? And so. We, you know, uh, how many people have been asked that before, been told that before? You, you've been told certain scripture where they say you're condemned because you have this, or you're, cond you're condemned because you don't, or you're not condemned because you don't have it. And so the question that's always asked is, is it okay to have a body piercing or a tattoo? And the first scripture that everybody always brings to us is Leviticus 9.28. And um, that's Old Testament. If you haven't read it before, it's Old Testament. It talks about tattoos. And what it says, it says, uh, do not cut your bodies for the dead and, or put tattoo marks on yourself. It says, I am the Lord. It says, do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves. I am the Lord. Now, there are several reasons why this doesn't apply to Christians today, but I need you to understand uh, something. First, it's, uh, what it's referring to is at a certain time. You've got to understand what's going on at this time. You have the pagan, which are the non-believing people uh, of this time, and they were polytheists. Some of them were polytheistic, where they had multiple gods, and they believed in worshiping all types of gods. If you read anything in the Old Testament, then you read, read about them worshiping calves, golden calves, and all kinds of different uh, pictures and, and um, things. And so they're, the, they were worshiping all these fake gods, and were quick to draw up these fake deities uh, based on no substance, just on sometimes it's sometimes somebody's belief or sometimes somebody's dream or sometimes somebody's picture or something they created. And what we've realized is anything short of the God of Israel uh, is false, is demonic. The scripture says that, that, that when you entertain those types of people, you're entertaining demons. When you, when you worship idols, you're worshiping demons. You're not worshiping gods. And so this is referring to the worship of demonic forces by cutting their flesh. What they would do is cut their flesh. I mean, people still do that today. You've seen people around the world where they have earrings that are enormous or they have plates or they have whatever. And, um, you know, they, they worship false gods. And because they, they do that, uh, the scripture says that these are demonic forces. So it's referring to the worship of demonic forces. And um, these people would, the people would do this back in the time 
in hopes of a favorable position with a, somebody who's passed on, um, a favorable position for themselves, um, or just to worship what they called God at that time, uh, which was an idol. Now, the reason this law was made, do not cut your bodies for the dead or put tattoo marks on yourselves, for I am the Lord. This law was made to prohibit believers in God, the true God, from having similar practices. And so, you know, uh, we even see it today where people have statues and all kinds of things that they worship other than God. And some people have pictures of Jesus and say, oh, this is Jesus. No, 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 careful. So this law was made to prohibit believers from having similar practices back in those days. Now, the main reason that uh, this doesn't apply to us today is because that this was under what we call the Mosaic Law. This was the laws of Moses uh, according to, um, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all the different laws. These are the laws that were laws of Moses. And so, now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I need you to understand something about those laws. Romans, not Larry Gray, but Romans 10.4 says that Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes, which means that prior to the laws identify sin. They identify a need for a savior because everybody was breaking laws. Everybody was sinning and nobody had uh, access to the savior at that time. And so the laws identify a need for a savior but the purpose of Jesus coming down was to complete the law, to fulfill the purpose of the laws. And it says in Romans 10, 4, that Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. And I'm sure everyone in here believes in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. believe in Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's what it says in Romans 10, 4. Also, right now, Ephesians 2, 15 this also expresses that through his sacrifice, through the death and, and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he abolished the laws of the commandments expressed in the ordinance, ordinances. So all the laws and the requirements that they had died with Christ. They were fulfilled with Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? It means that we are not subject to following those laws because if, you're, if you subject yourself to following those laws and trying to um, fulfill all those laws, then you don't acknowledge that Jesus died for all of those laws. And so the purpose in saying, I must do this, I must do that, do that, is saying that Jesus doesn't exist. And so when we uh, acknowledge that Jesus has existed, we know that he has fulfilled all the requirements of the law. So what is the one law or the laws that Jesus gives is to love. He gives us the laws to love. Love your neighbor, love God. And so this means that we're not subject to the following, following the Old Testament laws because Jesus fulfilled them for us, sealed by his death. So you have to know this. You cannot get any closer to God trying to fulfill the Old Testament laws. Did anybody know that? You can't get closer to God trying to fulfill the Old Testament laws that were perfected in Christ. You get closer to God by trying to follow Christ, not fulfill the Old Testament laws. So it's simple. So understand this. Since the law, uh, since that, uh, since that it, it was through the law, and the law was through Jesus, fulfilled through Jesus Christ, we are not subject to the law anymore. You cannot use the law as a way of saying no tattoo. You get that? So, so if somebody comes to you and says, hey, well, in Leviticus, it says this. You say, well, that's the law. And so either you follow all the laws or none of the laws. You have to be careful with that because some people say, well, you can't have tattoos because of what this says. No, 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 that's not true. If you, have, if, if you follow that, you have to follow all of them because breaking one commandment is just like breaking all of them. You have to know that all of it was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Now, now that we understand that, you can't use Leviticus. Now that we understand that, you have to be careful on what you use in the Old Testament because of the time period of the law. So you can't go back to the Old Testament and say, well, this is what we're supposed to do because the Old Testament was based on Old Testament. It was based on the laws, and the laws were fulfilled through who? Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. All right, so we understand that. 
So what does the New Testament say about tattoos? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Not what the Old Testament says, but what does the New Testament say about tattoos or body piercing? And I want you to write this down. Everybody ready to write this down? Yeah. It says nothing. <laughs> see, see, y'all were all ready? Y'all like, he's gonna give me this profound scripture? It says absolutely nothing. That doesn't mean that we're supposed to go and tattoo ourselves, do all this other stuff, but it does not say anything about tattoos. So now you heard it from me. It does not say anything about this. And, and so, then what do we go on? Because uh, in my olden days, before I followed the Lord, everybody say long time ago. Long time ago. Everybody say long, long time ago. Long, long time ago. I received tattoos. Um, several tattoos at, uh, years ago. And if I didn't understand the scripture, I would have believed that I would be condemned forever according to the Old Testament scripture because I didn't understand it. And be, though I love the Lord, I would be condemned because I had that too. Man, I, when I read that scripture the first time and did not have the knowledge behind it, I was like, man, it's too late now. It's already after the fact. I got, <laughs> what are we going to do now? You know, God, help me with this. Um... And so the question you have to ask yourself when seeking God, it's an important question because, you know, we say we get our tattoos and we're representing the Lord or we get this and we're representing the Lord. And, and so the true question you have to ask yourself when seeking something and, or seeking if something is from God clearly is does it benefit me or does it benefit God? It's a question. Simple question right there. Write that down. Does it benefit me or does it benefit the Lord? It's real simple. And so, of course, you can use that question for any type of subject that we're talking about. But today we're talking about tattoos. Mm -hmm. To get yourself straight to the Lord, you can ask yourself that about anything, anything you're dealing with. Here's an example. Do, does that argument benefit me or does it benefit the Lord? That helps us all. Sometimes we get in arguments about things and we argue with our spouses or our friends or our family members and the question you have to ask yourself is does it benefit you what you're arguing about or does it benefit the Lord? If it benefits the Lord, then sometimes it's worthwhile to argue over the, uh, the situation to get your point across, but to show scripture behind it. If it benefits the world or if it benefits you, what growth are you getting by arguing over it? You, you see, we're supposed to be vessels of God. As vessels of God, it's okay to debate over certain things, but to lose friendships over things that don't benefit God, it's not helping you. So the question you ask yourself is, does it benefit me or does it benefit the Lord? Now, when we go, when we use this in reference to tattoos, the question is, are they okay? It doesn't have any scripture in the New Testament that talks about tattoos. First, I want you to write this scripture down. But, but we can use certain scriptures that refer to general things to apply to what we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The Bible doesn't talk about every single circumstance, but the Bible does give general practices that we have. And if we follow those general practices, it makes our lives easier. 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, 3 and 4, verse 3 and 4. He gives direction, Peter's giving direction to wives. That's probably applicable to this subject that we're on today. This is what he says. He says, your beauty should not come from the outward adornment, such an elaborate hairstyle or wearing of jewel, or gold jewelry or fine clothes. And this is the important thing. It says, rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is of great worth in God's sight. <clears throat> so write that part down. It should be of your inner self. And so before, before, before I knew the Lord, before I followed the Lord, I got glory on my outer self. You understand that? Uh, before I knew the Lord, I got glory on my outer self. I was like, man, I'm going to get tatted up. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I want to get a picture of this, a picture of that. I want to get this. I want to have this type of picture. Oh, man, I think I'll get this now. And then I was all about muscles. Everybody working out. Everybody, think about it. Before you knew the Lord, that's what your thought process was. 
Oh, women, now what do we think about, oh, I'm gonna wear this, I'm gonna wear this, 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 this these nice clothes this, to, to attract men, to attract this, to attract that. Isn't that how we do it? Before we knew the Lord? Everybody say long time ago. Long time ago. Before, I didn't say before. Some of y'all are like, I still do that now. No, no, that's a work in progress. <laughs> so, it says your beauty should not come from outward adornment. Rather, it should be of your inner self. So I got the glory from what I did back in those days. Now, if we sh uh, shift to the new world that we're in, God gets the glory on our inner selves. The change that happens in us, that's on a day-to-day -day basis, a process that, 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 that the word cuts through, the word changes us. Think about the things we used to do. Think about how we used to dress, how we used to act, what used to concern us. Now it's, it's from the inside. We're not worried about how people think about us. We're worried about what God thinks about us. So I got the glory on my outer self when I was in the world. But now God gets the glory on my inner self. Write this down. God gets the glory on our inner selves. I want you to write this scripture down also. 1 Corinthians 6.19. It was basically addressing the immorality, not addressing tattoos directly, not addressing body piercings directly, but it was, it was addressing the immorality. And the general language you can apply to this subject also. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? It says this. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify God in your body. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. You know what that means? means you're not yours anymore. You, you don't own yourselves anymore. When you gave your life to Christ, you gave it. You didn't say, God, you can have me, but then I'm going to go do my own thing. You say, God, I accept you, and I accept your punishment. Therefore, I am yours. And so you gave yourselves to Christ, which means you don't own this anymore. This temple is not yours anymore. And so if you're not your own, you were bought at a price, it says glorify God in your body. What does that mean? It means that uh, even though I may have tattoos, even though I may have body appearances, even though I may do all that stuff, that's not a deal breaker. That just means from here on out, I do things to glorify God. Why? Because I sold my body to God. I said, he's become my, the, uh, the uh, he's given me the Holy Spirit, and now the Holy Spirit resides in the temple that I have. And so because of that, from this moment on, I do things to glorify God. When I was young, I used to glorify myself. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, what makes us beautiful? What makes you beautiful? Is it having your hair nice and you know, like mine, is it, is it having, you know, wearing suits, is it dressing nice, is it looking beautiful, is it, I mean, what makes you beautiful? You have to ask yourself that question, because once you shift it from one world to the next, what made you beautiful in the last world doesn't make you beautiful in this same world. God's not going to look at you and say, man, you are a beautiful specimen, come on to eternal life. He's not going to look at you and say, man, you, you had it going on. Those jeans you used to wear when you were on the earth gives you eternal life. Man, you used to wear the top-notch colognes and all that other stuff. Man, you have eternal life. That's not what he's going to use. He's going to use what you have in you, the inner beauty. And so what makes you beautiful is not all this other stuff looking great and having all the great things and, or whether it be whatever your interest is, whether it be tattoos or piercings or whatever, none of those things make you beautiful. The only things that make you beautiful is God displayed through you. Yes. That's it. That's it. You can be a person on the streets who may not smell well, but if you have the Spirit of God in you, another person with the Spirit of God in you will see that person as beautiful. Or you can have top-notch dress on, 
You can have the best shoes on. You can have your hair done up. You can smell great, but reek of filth because you don't have the Holy Spirit. So what makes you beautiful is God displayed through you. Now it doesn't mean that you are condemned because of your tattoos. Because some people say, well, I need to get rid of these tattoos so I can serve God. That's not, that's not how it works. The, if you're going to live by Leviticus, live by all of the laws. And you'll find that it's impossible to do that. It doesn't mean that you're condemned because of your tattoos or body piercing. It's not a deal breaker like we said earlier. Because you have to, and the reason it's not a deal breaker, the reason it's not, it doesn't destroy you is because it's not the reason you got saved in the first place. The reason you got saved is not because you walked on water and glowed in the dark. It's not because you looked like a, a savior, uh, like Jesus needed you. It's not because you dressed the right way or smelt the right way. The reason you got saved is because of a work of God, not a work of you. And if it's a work of God, then you understand that what, you do, what you've done will not condemn you or what you will do will not save you. And so if you understand that, then you walk in freedom in Christ. Learn to love. And learning to love, it makes you understand that if you come with piercings, if you come with tattoos, you know that God will use that to further somebody else into the gospel. Because God has used the things that I have had that I thought of in the world to bring me closer. How can I talk to somebody about, uh, about breaking an addiction that I've never had? Right. You see, how can I do that? How can, if I've never had the addiction, and you have, then when you come into talking to that person, you can, you can relate to them where I can't. Mm -hmm. So don't try to condemn yourself for the things you have or the things you don't have or what you've done or what you've not done. Just give all honor and all glory to God and go from there. Now, so it makes us beautiful displaying this. And the closer you get to God, here, here, here's the beautiful thing. The closer you get to God, the more you seek less of your own and more and desire more of his glory. When I started moving towards Christ, when Christ drew me, when God drew, the Father drew me, I used to go in the way of my flesh. I used to go in the ways of what I wanted, what I desired, what's in it for me, what, you know, how to have more money, how to have more success, what can I do, who can, who can uh, honor me or whatever. And then when I shifted, when God shifted me, it went from, oh man, I'm the deal, I want to show my muscles and show this to, man, I want to give all honor and glory to God. It's not even about me anymore. I don't, I don't worship anything else anymore. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. I'm not worried about showing people my tattoo. I'm not worried about showing people a piercing. I'm not worried about showing people anything that is of me because I've given my life to him. My body is his. And so because my body is his, everything that comes out of this body or comes unto this body is in honor of God. So the closer you get to God, the more you seek his glory. I want you to write this scripture down. Romans, Romans 12. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So now that we understand that our bodies are God, that we have given them to God, we are bought at a price. He is, he is the ownership. Sometimes we, you know, has anybody ever, uh, you, you ever seen the people who buy cars uh, or who want to buy cars um, and they're paying a monthly payment on the car. And um, I hope there's nobody in here. <laughs> but they're paying a monthly payment on the car. They got these nice rims on the car. Got this nice booming system. I'm just, I love it. Got a nice booming system and still got a monthly payment. And then they get a clear understanding when they don't make that monthly payment that those rims and that system goes with the car when they take the car. You ever, ever experienced that? <laughs> They still gonna take the car. You're like, give me back my rims. It's not your rims anymore. You haven't made your payment. Those are our rims. <laughs> well, can I get my system? It's not your system. You put it in our car. That's right. <laughs> we thought we owned it, right? And because, and then and the same thing with apartments. We live in an apartment, we tear the walls up and everything else, and then we get out of the apartment and leave it in trash because they were mean to us. 
And then you don't get your deposit back. You're like, give me my deposit. You're not getting your deposit. Why? Because that wasn't your apartment in the first place. <laughs> They paint the wall. That's right. You pay, you paint the wall. The children tear it up and everything. And then what happens? You lose that deposit. Now you're serious and you're mad. Oh, that's what that was for. Yes, what that was for. So it's the same thing with understanding your body is not yours. It, you don't own it anymore. Stop acting like you do. It's not yours anymore. It is God's. And if it's God's, you gotta know he owns it. He can do with it what he wants. He can give you a sickness. He can allow you to go through the worst circumstance in your life. He can allow you to live old and, and die old or whatever he wants to do. Or he can allow your body to, 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 to grow and be great or deteriorate, whatever he wants, but it's his. Stop acting like it's yours because that's what the enemy uses to make you think God is against you. So it says, I appeal, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What this is saying, your spiritual worship is giving yourself to God. God, this, my, my whole body is yours. Do it. See, sometimes we say we give our bodies to our wives or our husbands and stuff like that, but the, the scripture says give your body to God. And so this is a holy, and ex a holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And sometimes we put things in our bodies because we think it's our bodies and we can do whatever we want with it. And then we get mad when we get sick. But now we understand, we understand our bodies are not ours, they're God's. And when you, when you put things in your bodies that you shouldn't, see, it's amazing how we will take care of other people's stuff better than we will take care of our stuff. If you borrow the neighbor's lawnmower, You'll take care of that lawnmower better than your own lawnmower. You'll bring it back cleaner than you would clean your own lawnmower. I hope y'all would. Some of y'all still have your neighbor's lawnmowers, I'm sure, right? <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with service. <laughs> so it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, be by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which, it, which is your spiritual worship. It says, not, do, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is acceptable and perfect. Now, you have to know that the world wants you to think one way, God needs you to think another way. The world wants you to think one way, God needs you to think another way. The world wants you to pressure your mind. The world, that's all the West world does is pressure your mind. Oh, uh, what is the Jones wearing? What are these people wearing? Look how nice those shoes are. Oh, uh, what, what do women say? Oh, that's a nice purse. I like that purse. I like this. I like that. And what, where'd you get your hair done? Where'd you get your nails done? Why, where'd you get that perfume? Where, isn't that what we do all day, every day? That's the world. So the world wants to pressure your mind from the outside by what you see to make you conform. The world wants you to conform to the ways of the world. Get the best video games. Isn't that this how kids do it? New video games come out, they don't want their old one anymore. If the new one never came out, they'd love their old one for the rest of their life. That's right. True story, Atari. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, some, some of y'all out there, right? That's all we had. That's right. We didn't know anything else, because that was a super thing. Even though the tank went the same way when it was going back and forth, it was still pointing the same. I'm not <laughs> Pac-Man did the same thing. <laughs> but it was Pac-Man. How many people were happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We would play it. We played it. We played it over and over again. We learned all the so-called patterns and everything right. else on Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man. We didn't care that it didn't point, it only pointed in one direction. That's right. <laughs> we, we didn't care that the tank's bullets bounced off of every wall, went all around. Look, I'm just telling you how we grew up. That's right. It never changed with us. Now we see all the games that came after that, Intelligent Vision, Coleco Vision, all those other things that came after that, and then you wanted those games. But when you had Atari, it was the best thing in the world. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. So I'm telling you this for a reason. What makes us beautiful is conforming, transforming on the inside. The world wants to pressure your mind from the outside and make you conform to its ways. The Lord wants to renew your mind from the inside and may be transformed by him. 
How does he transform you? He changes you. He makes you no longer interested in everything else and what everything else and everything that everybody else has. The outside says, I must have this. Look at what these people have. How many of y'all have looked at the neighbors and said, man, I wish I could have what they had? How many of you have looked at somebody else and said, man, I wish I could have the clothes they have or have the vehicle that they have? That's what the outside does. The renewed mind, mind says that I love me some Jesus. I want to know more about Christ. I love what he does for me. It makes your outside change, but it's not because of anybody else. It's because you're pleasing to God. You're, you're, you're worshiping God. I, I don't wear $3,000 suits, and even if I had the money, I wouldn't wear a $3,000 suit, not as long as people are starving. Because I'm not interested in that. But because I love God, he'll dress me up. You, you get what I'm saying? He makes me change. Now, I'm not worried about what other people think about me. I'm worried about what God thinks about me. And God changes me from the inside out. I'm not worried about the desires of my children. I'm worried about teaching them values that only God can give them. So the renewed mind says, I love Jesus. And I want the world to know. Instead of saying, I love the world and don't care what Jesus thinks. What makes you beautiful as a believer is more of the Lord displayed in you. That's it. If you can't have more of the Lord displayed in you, you don't look beautiful. Beauty is not the stuff of the world. Beauty is God working in you. The change, learning how to overcome anger, how to overcome fear, how to overcome rejection. Not worried about what other people say, but only worried about what the Lord said. Learning how to forgive, not worried about what the person thinks. You're only worried about what God thinks. You're not worried about responses. You're worried about God. What makes us beautiful is more of the Lord displayed in us. And so people say, well, what about the tattoos of the cross? Do people get tattoos of the cross or scripture that's on their arm? And I'm not here to judge that. I'm not here to say whether it's right or wrong. But you ask yourself the one question. Did you get it to glorify you? Or did you get it to glorify God? That's the simple question. If you got it because you wanted people to see, not the God in you, but to see how awesome the scripture looked on your arm, that's the wrong reason. Yes. You have to let God make you beautiful by displaying himself through you, through his son, Jesus Christ. Now next week we're going to discuss the process cleverly disguised as trials. The trials that come because of giving your life to Christ. What happens following that? You have to know this because it's going to happen to every one of you. As long as you're taught the word of God and understand the word of God, there will be trials in your life. Some of you thought you come here and the trials end. No, you come here and the trials begin. That's when they start. So I dare you to show up again. So next week we'll discuss this process. That's disguised as trials. If you've been blessed, I need you to give, stand and give God glory. Amen.